before. I started ski racing in 1990 and raced five years in the World Cup, carrying balance boards and ski machines with me all over the Europe and North America, um, and teaching athletes how to work on their balance and stability while they're training. In 2002, we were honored to be the Small Business of the Year in Calgary. Uh, in both 88 and 2010, uh, Calgary uh, Federer donated in the 2010 Olympics, both to R Richmond and to Whistler, we outfitted entire athlete villages with all the equipment, functional fitness equipment for the athletes, so that those World Cup athletes coming to Canada experience their Olympic, their Olympic uh, gold medal performance would have great gear to train and get ready for that very, very important day in their lives. And uh, in 2016, we were honored, my wife and myself, with the small uh, Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award for Western Canada. So in all that process, we had four pillars to our company. It's uh, training and athletics, injury and rehab or prevention, family fitness, and the active office. And we learned that the products we use in those four categories are very similar. It's more about the stage you're at in your life, not the age you're at in your life. And we all go through different things and different re re uh, realizations in where we're at in our lives. And we might be young, very healthy athletes, and as we get older, things unfold, illness, accidents, and injuries that give us different needs and different requirements in our lives. We might be very healthy and then I call it the bus factor, you might get hit by a bus. And then your rules change and you have different needs. Um, but we still have to work with gravity and it's the same gravity that Napoleon dealt with and Caesar dealt with. It's exactly the same as it was then as it is today. It pulls straight down, pulls us into earth and we have to react to it. And that is what we work every day with. And Joan working with the astronauts until they got out into outer space, didn't realize that not having gravity is a very different world, and it has a huge, profound effect on our body. And only really now are we starting to learn that we can play with gravity, turning it up and turning it down, a bit like volume on a stereo, and it has different effects on our body. We've always lived in a world of 1G, unless we went onto a roller coaster, or for example, speed skiing down a hill at a very high speed that would change the gravitational force in the body and has an impact on how we work. Um, but just jumping ahead there a little bit, Fitter's values have always been the same. Integrity is our number one value. We do what's right for all the stakeholders. We make quality products that help affect quality of life. And we work with all sorts of people from the doctors to elite athletes to handicapped children. So we want to make, give them service that meets their needs and expectations. And that's always been our objective. In doing that, we've learned from a lot of very unique and intricate interesting individuals and done some very interesting things. Um, we stayed focused and persistent to the concept of working with gravity and time. Uh, going fast on skis at 205 kilometers an hour required a lot of focus and persistence and that's what I've continued to do with my life around balance. I'm a Libra, I have a fundamental balance disorder, so I've always really stayed focused on balance and stability. I have a huge regard and respect for cardiovascular and strength, and I know how important those things are, but all the products we've always worked at around Fitter have always been around balance and stability, and they've also been around fun and quality of life. These are, those of you who remember Sky Mall, you know the magazine that was so successful in the airlines for a long time, all of the products you see here are all things that had to do with mobility, movement, and, and, and um, working with gravity and, and quality of living. And so we had all these different things that would come our way, and I just kept finding all these different products. Many were successful, uh, lots failed. You know, many, many different products we came across failed. Uh, but I had the great honor of being the first distributor ever for Bosu, you know, very, very successful balance product. And the first distributor ever for the TRX, another very successful product. And a lot of these ones coming up are things we've worked with and tried to develop and hit and miss on many. And in that process, I've spent my whole life trying to work on a high quality of living with my friends and family and doing fun things. These are the reasons I do what I do so I can go with my wife and my family and my kids to the mountains um, and just do fun things, make life worth living, keeping it simple, keeping it fun. Um, my one friend, Herb, we didn't have a motorboat, but he said, hey, the river's going by us and we have a really good piece of wood and we got a rope. If we throw the wood in the water and we go to where the currents are going fast, we can, you know, wakeboard just on the river. Now, that sounds like a fun idea. So that's what we were doing. That's what Ty's doing right there. Just, you know, wakeboarding on the river. Who needs a boat if you don't have a boat? <laughs> There's lots of ways to get things done. 
Anyways, all those things are about quality of life and quality of living and working with time and gravity. And it led us to the concept of SAM. SAM is uh, practicing stability as a daily habit, just like brushing your teeth or wearing a seatbelt. You don't just do it on Tuesdays and Sundays or you know, um, wear your seatbelt on Friday nights. You do it all the time as a lifestyle habit. And we've learned if you practice stability throughout your day, every day, you have better agility of play and better mobility for life. And it's a habit you form regardless of your age or stage of your life. And that's what we've really tried to get people to understand is that is the most important habit you can form to age gracefully. Because when we're young and bulletproof and healthy, you know, balance and cardio and strength all have a similar relationship, but we tend to take balance and movement for granted. As we get a little bit older, balance and movement gets bigger and more important, and as we age, it gets bigger and bigger all the time. And most of us take it for granted until something goes wrong, and then it's a slippery slope and it's very hard to get it back. And that's why that, you know, the active office became so important to fitter is that we didn't want to chase the three hours in the gym or the yoga class on, on you know, after work. We really wanted people to have movement in the trunk at the workplace and make that eight hours an asset for their long-term health. And that's been our long-term mission. And really, speaking of missions, that's how we met Joan. Um, I kept seeing this whole aging thing happening as more and more important. Clearly, if you don't use it, you'll, you'll lose it. And if you can imagine who could give good advice about using it so you don't lose it, this gentleman here clearly could give us all good advice about staying young for a long time. If you're barefoot water skiing at 80 years old, you're getting something done correctly. Um, we learned that we need to have products that were good for all levels of people, green, blue, and black. I obviously base that off the skiing industry. And we developed products over the years that were good for all different levels of users, depending on the stage or the age of their life. And um, that is sort of what Fitter's all about. And then when the active office concept came in, I saw that eight hour window it became highly important, and all of you are sitting on swappers or on chairs or standing on platforms um, that allow you to move. And I, I think what I see Andy and Eric in production and shipping here at our company, they're always standing on things in the back area that allow them to have movement while they're working. And it just makes the quality of life so much better and much, so much healthier for their bodies. Um, you know, we are, the reality is we are on a future a projectile getting gray because in the 60s only one in 16 people were over 60 years old or 65. In the 90s it was one in 13 and by 2050 it's going to be one in five people will be over 65 years old. And that slippery slope that we get into with aging, if we lose our mobility it's very hard to get it back. So we know that if we can learn to implement it in our daily life as a habit, we stay much healthier and have a much higher quality of life. And it's not just exercise, it is movement. That's why actually everyone needs to stand up right now, just because that's the most important thing we can do. If in doubt, the most important thing to do is just stand up and let your body recalibrate. This is what jo Joan has really taught me after she'll tell us more, but for 40 years at Nassau that she learned so much. But if you're not sure what to do, just standing up for one minute and letting your body recalibrate and get its bearings back with that g-force of gravity that pushes straight up and down and give your body a chance to recalibrate and balance itself is so so important um you know on the moon there's only one third as much gravity so if we're going to go to the moon in 2024 and have a colony there somehow those people have to live there and that's what the whole g-force thing's about and ralph later talked in the 60s about making the auto industry safer and there was a bit of an argument that seat belts well, if you put a seat belt on and the car gets in a crash and if it catches on fire, then you won't be able to get out of the car and you'll burn to death. And that makes seat belts very unsafe. And it was such a horrible argument because it wasn't the problem was not the seat belt. The problem was that cars probably shouldn't catch on fire when they get in accidents. So it was a paradigm shift of thinking that needed to change. The auto industry thought it'd be too expensive to put seat belts in cars. They discovered that they made money on making cars safer, which they got very good at that they could actually have a profit center and us all buying our forty to $100,000 cars now understand they learned how to make a lot of money making cars safer. But the industry and society made a huge paradigm shift unfold. And what we're presenting is that there's a huge paradigm shift coming in front of us right now in the fitness and the wellness industry about movement, about healthcare. And to be honest, the 1G box we've been living in our whole life, that everything happens in 1G, is about to go through a paradigm shift. We're gonna start using gravity differently than we have for the entire 
lifespan of man on Earth, where we will start harnessing gravity different and using it to our benefit and to our health, and to use things like centrifuges and other items as we travel into outer space and here on Earth to improve our health. And that's what Joan has really done at NASA and her work right now in her books. She's dared to venture to places where men and women have not gone before and just helping us today to understand that. So we're lucky to have her here to share her 40 years of experience. In a minute here, Margaret will introduce um, Joan. She'll give us her talk. But just before that, I want to show to you guys, for the first time we showed it yesterday, a very short little snippet. It's one minute long that we made up that we're about to put in the public domain that summarizes what FITTER stands for and really what Joan and me and Margaret and all of us stand for. So just one second. It just takes a green piece of technology to change her. So we made this up a little while ago. Sam was our guy I talked about a second ago there. And this is our Sam story. Can you hear that? Nikos was born to Greek parents in Alexandria, Egypt, studied in London, and taught at Ohio State Medical School. She's a pioneering research scientist who conducted seminal studies in space medicine, inactivity physiology, stress, healthy aging, and making chocolate truffles. Joan was recruited by NASA in 1964 to study stress in astronauts. She later worked on ways to keep astronauts, including John Glenn, healthy in space and then back to Earth's gravity. Vernico served as chief of the Life Sciences Division at NASA, NASA's Ames Research Center in California, and ended up as director of NASA's Life Sciences Program at its headquarters in, D in DC from 1993 to 2000. Winner of numerous scientific and leadership awards, member of the International Academy of Astronautics, she was inducted into the International Astronautical Federation Hall of Fame in 2018 and received its top award, the Emil Allen Award, in 2019. Motivational speaker, speaker and author, her books include The G Connection, Harness Gravity and Reverse Aging, Adventures in Chocolate with her husband Jeffrey Hazan, the groundbreaking Sitting Kills, Moving Heels, followed by Design to Move and her latest, Stress Beyond 50. Her mission, to empower individuals to have greater control over their health and well-being through frequent daily movement, making a friend of stress, and living a long life with a smile. Please join me in welcoming Joan Benicos.
Good morning. I'm so pleased you came. I hope you'd be pleased that you came. <laughs> and maybe you learned something. And this is about making you aware of you and your health so that you can begin to decide if you have to go to a doctor, the questions you're going to ask them. So often, we just go to the doctor and say, I'm not feeling well. Well, what's the doctor supposed to do? We have to meet them halfway. We have to be intelligent and knowledgeable so that we can help them focus on things that they can help us. I like philosophy. But let's talk about gravity therapy. What is it? Well, it's about using gravity to restore health. Why do we need to restore health? Well, because we made a mess of it. We end up, modern life has taken away our use of gravity, our use of movement. Our life has become more and more sedentary. You are experiencing benefit just by sitting on those things you're sitting on. I see you all swaying, I love it. <laughs> and all, most of new technology and advances and appliances have been designed with a good, good core, a good argument to make our life easier. Now think about it, what does that mean? It means that they help us do less and less and less and less. So in the process of doing less, we're actually not stimulating our body in the way nature intended it. And gravity therapy, in essence, replaces what's been taken away and brings our health back to what is considered normal. Well, you probably all remember or have heard about our universe and that we are really a spinning world. We like spinning. We enjoy spinning. Kids love spinning. Autistic kids love spinning more than even other kids. And it helps us be happy. We call it play. Growing up as a child, hopscotch, somersaults, jumping, all these were games, dancing. We call them play. And then suddenly, as we get older, uh, play doesn't happen quite as often. And eventually, we forget how to play. So bring play back into your lives. Very important factor. Why? Because play and all the movements that children, we as children did and do, involve the using gravity. Because gravity is all around us. Here as I speak, gravity is pulling head to toe towards the center of the earth. The fact that I'm standing makes is an advantage to my health. If I sit down and stand up even better because it sees the change from sitting to standing. And it's like a tuning fork that tunes our body to better health. So as the Earth rotates, and as planets and stars rotate either around the sun or around themselves, they generate gravity. And the force of gravity is very important in the universe because it keeps these planets and stars and everything together. Otherwise, they'd be floating around in the universe. So it keeps them together. So it has an important role. And therefore, as the Earth spins, that gravity is with us all the time. We really can't escape it unless we go into space unless we go far enough outside 
to fill the pyramid to a reduced area of ground. So, keeps us upright, plants grow up and down, and you know that as a child, if you turn it on its side, the plant on its side, it will turn around and grow upward and the roots will go down. I see smiles. We all done that, that experiment, whether we like it or not. <laughs> Gravity gives us a sense of direction, acceleration, weight or load. And especially acceleration and direction are terribly important and it's really come into importance even more with the invention of airplanes and eventually the space program. And we use gravity to train pilots to raise their level of the ability to withstand gravity as they uh, swerve around, take a corner, and uh, it's extremely important in the whole field of aviation and space. But it's nothing new in gravity therapy, really. Even though medical textbooks don't mention it, uh, Darwin in 1795 talked about gravity therapy, uh, and proposed that a centrifuge, and who knows what it looked like in those days, uh, spinning around would induce sleep, reduce heart rate and, fe and fever. In the 19th century, it was used to treat mental health. I don't know how, how successful they were, but <laughs> it was used to treat mental health. And by the 20th century, it is generally accepted that these acceleration forces of gravity and centrifugation exert identical effects. So gravity and acceleration produce the same sensation, the same effect of pulling from head to toe as we stand up. So think of yourself, you want to think of yourself, you, know, you, you say, all right, when you're in space, you have less gravity. If you lie in bed, you experience a slower effect of gravity because instead of pulling head to toe, it's pulling across your chest only, a shorter direction. And if you're uh, standing on Earth, or as, you, as we age, as the years pass by, as we stop being a child and playing, we use gravity less and less and less. And when we start using gravity less and less, we age and we see that the changes in space and the changes in aging are practically identical. Except they're faster in space than they are with the passing of years on the Earth. And when we, people ask me, what do you mean that we stop using gravity? I said, well, the best example I have is think of a pole dancer. You know who the pole dancer is? Oh, good. <laughs> I was worried <laughs> that you'd lead a sheltered life. <laughs> and think of the pole as gravity in one direction only. And the pole dancer is using gravity exposing their body to this force of gravity every which way and in every condition. And that's what we need to do every day in our everyday movements. Things our parents and grandparents used to do in the course of the day and we've stopped doing because we have some machine that vacuums the floor or, or we get assistance in carrying bags from the supermarket out to the car or we drive instead of walking or we... Uh, I know all kinds of things. You can think of your own ways of avoiding gravity. But actually, gravity is your friend. We think of gravity as the enemy that drags us down as we age. You have that image? Okay. It actually is our friend that helps us be healthy. And that's a very, very important thing. So one of the first uh, examples we had at the Ames Research Center, NASA, in California, where I, I was recruited and worked, 
was that of a man called Mr. Barrios. And Mr. Barrios was a 63-year-old who had been shot in the head and abdomen at the restaurant where he worked. And uh, he was sent for surgery to Stanford, which is right nearby in California, to the hospital. And they took away most of the uh, bullets and the shrapnel that, that he had collected in his abdomen and his brain. But there was one, piece, what, ten, uh, one centimeter piece of bullet left in his brain, floating in the ventricle. And the ventricle is a central hole in the brain, hole, uh, <laughs> chamber, sorry. Chamber in your brain, you might have a hole in the uh, on my mind, a uh, chamber in the brain that has fluid and it serves the spine with the cerebral uh, spinal corti cortical fluid and has circ or provides circulation in the brain and the spinal cord. And it was floating around in there and they figured that sooner or later it would get lodged somewhere and he would die. And they took him to Ames Research Center, which has eight centrifuges of various varieties, from single cells to humans, to 20 G centrifuges. And the medical officer there decided to ride on the centrifuge with Mr. Barrios under uh, video technology. And, uh, and follow look at where that bullet piece was and try to use gravity to move the bullet. And within one second at various gravity levels up to 5G, and you can get to appreciate that when you see our centrifuge, five times Earth's gravity, he was able to move the bullet from where it was floating around in the ventricle to a solid part of the brain that was not going to produce a problem. And Mr. Barrios lived a nice long life of good health after that. So it was the first incidence that I became aware of, and I became aware of because in 1967, Pat Nixon, you know, Richard Nixon's wife, during his campaign for the presidency, came to visit Ames, who knows why. And I was one of the few females, her being a female, I was presented as to talk to her. And we went to the centrifuge and we had Mr. Barrios as Exhibit A and how he had survived and this had happened to him. And I became aware of the incidents with the bullet having been moved by the force of gravity on the centrifuge. So that was a very interesting example of how gravity therapy could be used for benefit. More recently, of course, uh, gravity has been used uh, in other ways. Certainly, astronauts are exposed to less gravity, so we know what happens if you have less gravity. And what happens when you have less gravity is you experience a whole lot of, phy of physiological changes. Your cardiovascular system is affected. It's not as responsive. Your heart gets smaller in space. The stroke volume, its ability to pump, is reduced. Uh, muscles and bones atrophy. You must have heard about the problem with bone loss in space. Uh, you lose what we call plasma volume, the volume of fluid in your body, because the blood is up near your head and your sensors say, hey, I've got too much blood, let's get rid of it. So you pee more for the first few days. And so your, your blood volume goes down by 10 to 20%. And your immune system is suppressed. Uh, so you, you're much like someone on, on Earth with an uh, immune disease, disorder. Your sleep is really fouled up because you have no sensation of putting your head down, as one cosmonaut said to me. She said the most frustrating part of being in space was that I couldn't feel my head on the pillow. I mean, we don't think of that, do we? 
Uh, we go on airplanes and sit up and try to sleep. And we know that's not the best sleep in the world. And we forget that perhaps just the fact that what one puts a head down on a pillow during sleep has a role to play and is beneficial and gives us better sleep than when we're sitting up. So, so all of those things sound like what we would define as aging. Absolutely. And that came to me during the study of humans on the ground to support the research in space when I worked at NASA. And one of the things that uh, was proposed, and in fact Russian and German uh, doctors had done before even the space program, before the first person had ever gone to the space, was uh, to uh, find a way of mimicking the effects of being in space but on the ground. Well, we've got gravity all around us, so how are we going to do that? Doctors thought we were crazy. And, but they decided that, well, when I'm standing up, we call this 1G, uh, for lack of another description. But when we lie down, it's only pulling across our chest, which is much shorter distance than when I'm standing up. So they put volunteers in bed uh, for a few days or many days or months and discovered that, yes, indeed, the changes they saw in people lying in bed 24 hours a day without getting up, and that's important because posture is a, such an important stimulus to health, uh, were identical to those we experience as we age. And eventually I, I did some research in that respect. Uh, in the Victorian times, when you were sick, you went to bed. As Louis said, my, I experienced that. My father was a doctor and he put us to bed. It didn't matter how, what the sickness was. And put us to bed. And if you did not recover in three months, which we now know you wouldn't, you'd get as sick as astronauts in space for three months. They'd say, oh, you've got to stay in bed some more. Until you die. This is the model we used, lying in bed 24 hours a day, healthy, very healthy volunteers. Started with seven days of bed rest, went up to months of bed rest. It's used now universally as the model of choice to evaluate the changes that happen in space. Why is it slanting head down? Because some cosmonauts that returned from six months in space, before we ever had astronauts for six months in space, uh, complained to the, the doctors that when they tried to get sleep, and boy, did they want to sleep when they came back, they felt as if they were sliding off the foot of the bed. And so they couldn't get a good night's sleep. But what they did is they got some uh, Moscow director, home directors, which are about this thick, and put them under the foot of the bed. And they felt more comfortable. And they kept putting directories until being in that angle, which is minus six degrees head down, it felt horizontal, even though it wasn't. And the doctors, the Russian doctors, decided that that must be closer to being what it feels like to be in space than what we thought by just lying in a flat, horizontal bed. Eventually, as they took books, directories, off the support structure, horizontal felt horizontal. So they recovered from that change that they had experienced as a result of being in space. And I used that model, in fact, I introduced the model from Russia to, to the US, and we did many studies first studies in women, uh, many studies in, in men, uh, for many days. All the changes, to cut a very long story short, were identical to those we see with aging. A little slower than it was in space, but faster than they happened with aging, with the passing of time, let's say, because that's all aging is. It is not a disorder, it is not a disease. It is an adjustment 
to a lower use of gravity. Because yes, we go out, you know, we've got gravity all around us and we use it. Or, but we don't make our beds or, or vacuum or, or scrub the floors or uh, bend down to pick something up, stretch up to put something up, cook uh, on a stove for a long time, Sophia Lawrence's favorite pasta sauce. It takes an hour to cook. Uh, we sit and watch television, and perhaps we don't stand up during the commercials, which would be an excellent activity, non-exercise activity. But all these non-exercise activities we do provide the foundation to our health in, the, in, in everyday life. You want to add exercise? By all means add exercise, but add exercise. If you are in bed and exercise, it does not replace, it does not replace your health. So you need this foundation of what we call non-exercise activities, that all of us do, should do, to maintain our health. Right, this is in space, we have, mass but no load, no weight. There's no up or down, so all the stimulus of, that our brain and our inner ear gets of what is up and what is down, it's gone. And these changes do not, you know, we don't stimulate our brain. So there are many benefits to using gravity therapy. And we use the centrifuge to provide gravity therapy. It's been used before, and we are rediscovering that. We're doing it by putting, hopefully, putting a centrifuge, the Chinese are they're putting centrifuges up for their astronauts in space. The Japanese are building centrifuges. Uh, we are re-exploring that, the use of centrifuges. But nobody is using centrifuges for therapy, for treatment. You're already sick, you're already old, you're already whatever. Use gravity, use gravity. And one, the best way to use it in a measured way is to use something like a centrifuge. That's what it looks like when you're on there. That's what it feels like. It's, it's a fun ride. When was the last time you rode a roller coaster? No arms up? <laughs> Good grief, you guys are dull. <laughs> so, uh, Bonner here has a, the biggest child's uh, or adult playground probably in the city of Calgary, just in our building over here. He's got monkey bars almost as big as our shop here. Yes. So he'll show you, later today, he'll show you a really good playground. <laughs> and for those of you that are here that haven't been to move to So move, he uses gravity. He gets it. Yeah, well, he gets it. <laughs> It's gravity. not no centrifuge, but he certainly has a... Very gravity is use. there to be used, and we need to use it because we evolved in it, we developed it. We were talking about a, may a maypole earlier today, that, yeah, yeah. the yeah. uses of a maypole. You yes. Saying that. Yeah. I think, do you have a maypole? I'm not sure what a maypole is. Uh, in the 17th century, the they'd spinning. run, the, the, the fighting men, sling. Run, they'd run in a circles sling. around, they'd swing, and they'd run full speed, they'd go and hang in the air. And, oh. Spinning around. It was a You need to get one. <laughs> we have similar things, but not. Yeah, right. Yeah. Camelot and those guys would use yeah. that as a courting tool wow. uh, in the spring. Nice. <laughs> but yeah, you, we'll show it to you after I know that don't know Bonner and his wife have a beautiful facility just from the other end of the That's building there. Great. But he is a driver of the um, Bessonecto. Addict. Is. Chicken out of <laughs> <laughs> it is an addiction. We love it. And it is, you know, it's, it's, it's a bum rap to say gravity is your enemy that drags you down. Well, like hell it drags you down if you don't go. But it's there to be, it's there for fun, it's there for dancing, it's for, there for all kinds of things that we do and we forget about it. Okay, thank you. Joan, you had mentioned to us um, the effects of just standing up. Yes. And you told us a couple of stories about yeah. the effects of that. Can you share those? Well, we the, si 
Yeah. You have time? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And if you stretch, you, you get yeah. even better access to your gravity, and you just sit down again. And it's not how long you stand for. The inner ear is very sensitive to the switch. It's like an electric switch. And you turn it off, you turn it off. If you leave it on all the time, it's a, it's a square wave stimulus. Whereas if you switch on and off, it's like tuning your body, tuning your system. So you can sit down and stand up, you know. If you, we figured out that if you stand up every 20 to 30 minutes, that's probably the minimum you need to do. Think about it when you sleep, you're lying down, right? And that's a function in itself. You need to lie down to sleep. And then when the sun comes around, and we have sunrise, what do you do? Stand up. Get up. Stand up. You open your eyes, first of all, hopefully. <laughs> and you stand up. And then what do you do? And I get a quite a kinds of answers. Uh, you move. And if you move all, all day long, you're supposed to move. That's what light is supposed to do. And then when night comes, you lie down and sleep, hopefully, without your cell phone under your pillow, without lights all over the televisions on. You're actually meant to sleep. So if we look at Mother Nature and what we're given, it's all there. It's all provided for us. And it's, and the centrifuge can be an aid, and we hope that it is going to help a lot of people, a lot of people who have allowed themselves, for one reason or another, to develop some deficiency. Whether it's bone, or whether it's muscle, or whether it's immune system, or whether it's uh, lung problems, you know, to drain, the fluid from lungs and COPD, I mean, it is endless because every cell and every organ in the body is affected by aging. Aging is, as I said, it's not a disease. Every cell in the body changes. You don't get one thing. Everything changes. I wrote a chapter in the Encyclopedia of Bioastronautics comparison between aging and space. And the table, side by side, one of the things, in our circulation, our blood vessels have a lining. And as the blood swishes, hopefully you do something so it'll swish around, it stimulates this lining. This lining is called the endothelium. In space, even rats lose their endothelium. You know, you fly, you fly an animal like a rat for seven days, and they come back with almost zero endothelium. Scary. You lie in bed like my <laughs> test subjects. You are doing things to your endothelium. When a rat comes back from space, we were amazed because we knew that balance and coordination are affected when they return back to gravity because they've been unstimulated for well, however many days they used to go up on the shuttle, so it was seven days or nine days or whatever. But when they come back, you stand with your feet wide apart, like a child. Take, look at that one-year-old, how does it learn to walk? It starts out with its feet wide apart, and then it walks with its feet wide apart for a while, until you gradually learn to walk in gravity with your feet together. They would run into walls trying to go around the corner. Coordination. Uh, one astronaut uh, was an astronaut pilot, big strapping guy, was, was being tested in one of those, we call them posturography, the measures posture. And, and it's like a, a little square plate and it sways forward and backward this way a little bit, like, uh, like Roy's uh, board, 
balance boards. And uh, eyes open, eyes shut. That's his favorite. And his eyes happened to be shut. We were talking, people were talking around. And he started leaning forward, and I'm watching him, and he's going forward and forward and forward. And I think, oh my God, you know, the slapping guy is going to fall flat on its face. And rush to pick him up, obviously I couldn't pick him up if I tried. Other people came to and he shook his head and said, what happened? He said, but you were going to fall flat on your face. He said, and I said, you never put your arms up. To protect yourself. He said, I never had any sensation of falling. Nine days in space, the maps in his brain that he had developed relative to where he was, relative to his environment, were gone. We didn't know if he would recover. But he did recover. After living around and moving about and going into some rehab uh, experiences, after he returned. So, we are very adaptable. Our nerves and nerve connections grow back. There's no limit to our ability to survive on Earth as long as we use them. So before you go to the doctor, say, am I using gravity today? How many times did I stand up today? Not how long did I stand up, not how long, how many steps I took. That's a different issue. Right. How many times did I change position? How many times did I challenge my inner ear to reach up, to pick up something off the floor? Make a bed. Wash clothes and hang them up. Do some weeding in the garden. Dig. Anything. Walk. But not just walk. As a treatment. Walk because it's part of your life. It's living. Say, today I'm going to live. Not today I'm going to use gravity. <laughs> you know, use gravity. But today I'm going to live. I'm going to dance. I had a lady once in one of my talks, and she had a walker. She was a fair age. And she, she said, I dance. And I thought, you know, you've got a walker. How do you dance? Yeah, how? Well, in my kitchen, I had my, my chairs are on rollers. And I put the music up loud, and I hang onto the chair, and I switch around, and I dance. <laughs> yeah? She was having a ball. She looked great. Her posture was fantastic. <coughs> I see ladies walking by my window, and they're walking, and I think that's great, okay? How are they walking? What happened? You know this is the heaviest part of our body? You know that? You don't sit up right, and it's being pulled down. Just think, what am I not doing, what am I doing, what am I not doing? When I'm sitting, what am I not doing while I'm sitting? That's the question. Not how many hours I sit a day. Oh, we know we can sit up to 13 hours a day. Six to 13 hours, standard. It's not how many hours you sit. And the scientific community who looks at that and all the meta-analyses that are done or help us. It's not how many hours you sit, it's how many uninterrupted hours you sit. You're not made to sit. I mean, we invented a chair for the chief. They didn't use, you know, chairs for everybody. It was just the emperor or the chief sat in the chair. I know you're having a conniption. No, I shouldn't. <laughs> Time to get moving, you heard Margaret. Absolutely. So let's, let's get moving. Absolutely. <laughs> so Joan, can you tell us about your uncle? Yes. Because 
the, the use of gravity is really important in healing. Yeah. Well, I wrote, I wrote a book about sitting kills, moving and heals. But this is a story uh, about my uncle who was 99 years old. And he was a spry 99 years old. He had painted outside the of his house the year before. And he called me from Athens, Greece. I was in California. And he said, John, he didn't call me often, so it was unusual. He says, I'm in the hospital. I said, oh my goodness, what are you doing in the hospital? He said, well, I have a broken femur. I said, how did you get that? He said, well, I was going across the road in a pedestrian crossing, and I got hit by a car. And so I came to the hospital. What, what do you think I should do? I said, get out of the hospital. <laughs> Number one, get out of the hospital. Number two, he says, well, it's 7 p.m. here in Athens. I can't get out of the hospital. I said, all right, tomorrow morning. He says, tomorrow morning, I'll go back home. I said, yes. I said, can you sit up in the bed? He said, yes. OK. Can you sit up with your feet dangling over the side of the bed so that you have a quasi-vertical posture? No, it's not ideal. It's not the same as standing up, but it is bringing yourself in relation to gravity. Yes. I said, OK, now lie down again. Swing your legs up, lie down again. Now I want you to do that every 30 minutes. I just came to my mind. I was it. I was inventing in real time. And he said, yeah, I can do that. I said, until you fall asleep. And then tomorrow when you go to home to bed, get somebody, whoever you know, can help you, remind you every 30 minutes to stand up. Two weeks later, he calls me up. I thought, oh, no. who's got that? who knows what news. Oh, he said, I just went to the orthopedic surgeon. I said, yes. And they took an x-ray, and my bone has completely healed, healed, and the orthopedic surgeon couldn't believe it. That someone at 99 years old had a healed bone in two weeks the only exercise he did, or activity he did, was to stand up every 30 minutes. He didn't stand up and walk, he just stood up. And that was not you know, something I just invented, because I had done the, start, the last research I did before I became a bureaucrat, and that was <laughs> to ask the question, OK, so I lie in bed continuously, and I get all these changes. What is the minimum I need to do to prevent this change? And so I had uh, my volunteers brought to a treadmill on a gurney. They would stand up on the, on the treadmill and walk. At, when we started out, for 15 minutes. It's not necessary. Just at three miles an hour, which isn't an awful lot. So I needed a control to that, so I had the at other times, only stand up for the 15 minutes without the treadmill. I figured, OK, it's the difference between standing up and the treadmill that will give me the indication of how the activity helped. And I had a fancy statistician, and uh, we really did all the conditions in all of the subjects at different times. And it, anyway, it was a very well controlled study. And he called me up and he said, John, you're not going to like this. I said, what? He said, you, you know, your results, I don't think you're going to like them. And I said, OK, what, what had happened? Because it was all double blind. He said, well, standing was better than walking. And I thought, oh, gosh, you know, here I am going against the exercise community. Not a happy situation. And sure enough, standing is better than walking. Why? Why? Because standing does a different thing than what exercise does. When you exercise once a day, you're increasing your oxygen consumption. Yes, you're stimulating your circulation that hour. Maybe half an hour afterwards. But to have a lasting effect throughout the day, you have to be active throughout the day. And the best kind of activity is to keep your balance, organs, 
happy. And the way to keep your balance always happy is to change your posture so that your inner ear is down and up, and down and up. And that's very simple motion. Ah, you want to add stretching your arms as you saw me do? Do it. But, you know, as people say to me, people say, well, I walk when I stand up. I said, okay, but you don't need to. <laughs> and of course, you know, I'm not trying to discourage exercise. But you don't need to. But the question you have to ask is, when I'm sitting, what am I not doing? And what I'm not doing is moving. And moving during our daylight hours is the basis of health. That's why we say the stand-up desks. People say you know, sitting kills. I was pretty mm. good. And it's not standing heels. Yeah. It's moving heels. And the advantage of a standing yeah. desk is it gives you better access to moving. It's right. not standing is the solution. Yeah. But the chairs that these girls and the people are sitting on, at least in these chairs, you can move your hips yeah, so that the next yeah. movement's not a slow. Sure, of course. Because you talked about the head on the shoulders, right. and we know time and gravity is going to win. We know that. That's yeah. why we'll all lose in time and gravity. Yeah. If the next movement is a slouch or loss of spinal alignment, the challenge of that is you're saying to gravity and time, this hand in this card game of life, yeah. I'm going to let you win this hand. Yeah. But I'll get you next time around. And so if you can move your hips or you can keep and your head on your shoulders. Yeah. And that's why, you know, when I say the actions you do during the day, it could be picking up something. It could be a squat. It could be not as an exercise, but as a movement. Hello, friend. <laughs> I think that means it's time for us to go <laughs> think, What the heck are you doing here? <laughs> Were there any other questions out now? Yeah, we're going to go to the centrifuge, and uh, we'll have a chance for whoever wants to spend mm -hmm. within reason. We'll ask a few questions first, but yeah. uh, we'll do little five-minute sessions, and the spinners are in charge. But um, if anyone else want to ask Joan any quick questions? We'll have one-on-one -on -one time too. But anything else for you right now, Joan? No. Okay. I think maybe is it okay if we move on now. I think it will be wonderful. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.